I don't see any major challenges per se. They're all just interesting questions to work on and to try and make breakthroughs in. Yeah. My name is Angela Wu. I'm currently an assistant professor at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. I have been a faculty member for four years, and then prior to that, I did my PhD and postdoc at Stanford University. I guess um, during my undergraduate uh, time at UC Berkeley, uh, there were you know undergraduate research opportunities, and I figured I would just explore. I mean. My father is an academic, so he does research as well in engineering, and so it kind of runs in the family. Um, so I tried it out and I liked it, and that's sort of how I began. Yeah. I just carried on, yeah, and I was in a microfluidics lab already uh, okay, so. during my undergraduate. I think really it was because when I, uh, when I was at UC Berkeley, you know, the UC Berkeley program in electrical engineering and computer science is really strong, and they do um, a lot of circuits related stuff. But I wanted to do some biology, and so it seemed like the marriage of circuits with biology would be MEMS or like microfluidics, right? Bio-MEMS or microfluidics. Uh, and Luke Lee uh, is, is a very prominent researcher in that field um, at UC Berkeley. And so I just emailed him to see if I could work in his lab. And, you know, yeah, I got into his lab, and that's how I started in microfluidics. My current research projects are, it's pretty broad what I work on in my lab. So when I said um, I, I stayed in microfluidics, but I've also done work sort of related, is currently a large part of my research is single cell genomics, which of course everybody um, is aware that the droplet microfluidics has really enabled single cell genomics to flourish. And so we definitely do a lot of that um, in my lab. On the microfluidic side, we're also trying to apply some of the existing designs that have been done to new biological systems. So I think for my group, uh, our core strength is that we straddle biology and engineering. And so sometimes we see an interesting biological problem that can be solved using microfluidics, and it doesn't necessarily require invention of a new device. Uh, we're making the connections and choosing the appropriate designs to solve the problem at hand. So one of the studies that we're trying to do now is um, is to study sea urchins in microfluidics uh, in the context of things like environmental stress and environmental stimuli, because you know climate change is a big big issue and how sea creatures respond to that is very interesting to us. So that's one of the projects that I'm, I'm excited about. It was not related to microfluidics, but I'm very excited about it. Um, it's an approach for performing uh, both DNA and RNA sequencing from a single cell, from the same single cell. And uh, the reason why I'm excited is because I think it's the first method that will allow people to do so in a scalable manner. So you would be able to get both DNA and RNA information from the same cell, but for a lot of cells. We haven't adapted it to droplets yet, but uh, compared to previous methods that were developed, it would not even be possible um, to, to do that scale up. And so our method is scalable and we would like to move in the direction of of uh, integrating it into a microfluidic or other type of high throughput automated platform. I would say probably my postdoctoral work on single cell RNA sequencing is uh, something I'm very proud of. I was one of the first people to utilize a microfluidic platform for doing single cell RNA sequencing at scale. And before I did that, I don't think people really understood sort of how we would use single cell RNA sequencing and how the data would look and whether it would be comparable to traditional approaches and whether we could trust the data. So my work using the microfluidic platform really at scale and really allowed us to answer those questions and make people confident in the method and be able to use it for answering biological questions. Um, hmm. I mean, there are a lot of small challenges here and there. I, I think this field is generally very exciting to work in and there are always a lot of unanswered questions. Yeah, I don't know. I don't see any major challenges per se. They're all just interesting questions to work on and to try and make breakthroughs in. Yeah. 
So I think there are two answers to that. One is in terms of the single cell sort of analysis or interrogation, I would love to see more live cell applications. And I think microfluidics is great for that because you've got like the optical transparency uh, with most of, the, most of the chips that you can observe the cell directly. So if there were more ways developed to observe live cells and interrogate them as they're progressing through some you know, biological process, that would be really, um, really a, a, a big breakthrough. Um, another thing is that I, I feel that a lot of microfluidics researchers um, are really great at you know, doing engineering innovation but I would highly encourage like more discussion between biologists and uh, microfluidic engineers to get more of that sort of um, really useful application of the cool designs that we, we have right now. So I think it's not a breakthrough per se, but I think like having more of that dialogue will, will, will promote microfluidics in a really positive way. I mean, for, personally, I have a lot of interest in non-standard organisms. So people now have a lot of interest in doing things like studying human disease or like studying mouse. So for me, I would really like to see um, more studies on non-conventional organisms like marine organisms and just like weird creatures. So I think applying a lot of these microfluidic tools to these non-conventional organisms, which pose a lot of different challenges than how when we work with mammalian cells, um, I think for me, that's something I want to work on in the next five to 10 years, like creating tools and technologies for these weird, weird creatures. Yeah. I think my answer is going to sound a little bit boring, but I think basically finding out that, like, that molecular biology occurs more efficiently and in a lot of ways, like, better in a smaller volume um, has enabled all of these innovations or like these applications to, to exist. So for me, that very basic fundamental understanding uh, is, 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 you know, it's, it's exciting, I guess. I would like to see complicated microfluidics move more in the direction of like IC chips. You know, IC chips like way back when were also relatively simple. And then when you manufactured them, there would be like a high failure rate. And then when you use them, there would be failures. Like in microfluidics now, I feel like we also still have that. You know, when you fab the chips, a lot of them end up not passing QC. And then when the users use them, you end up with things like hoggages and things like that, which detracts from the user experience and increases the cost of using microfluidics a lot. I wish that we could move, I don't know how, but I wish we could move more to where IC is now, which is like the manufacturing and like the QC and, and the usage has become so standardized and so good that like you don't even really, I mean, as a user, you don't even really consider failure as a potential, you know, it's a rare event. And so I, I want microfluidics to go in that direction so that the biology users don't feel like it's such an investment to try and try this thing out, you know? Because I was trained in Steve Quake's lab and like in the Quake lab, microfluidics is like all about valving, right? Like back then, you know, all the devices that we designed have valving. And I think like there's a lot of utility with valving because it gives you so much control and like the parallel between like valve microfluidics and IC is like much more direct, right? But then the problem with valves is like you also have more chances for stuff to fail and not work. So I, I guess maybe if there were new ways to make valves or like new ways to use valves that would allow for more robust manufacturing and cheaper manufacturing, that would be great. Because then you would get both the versatility of the valves and also like maybe not have to deal with the failures of the valves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, again, going back to the thing of like linking together the users more with the inventors, I would encourage them to try to try to gain a background in biology. Like if that's the area that they want to, uh, you know, do an application of microfluidics in, I would encourage them to really gain an understanding of biology so that they can fully appreciate what the need is on the user end. And that way you don't end up making a device that nobody wants to use. Yeah, so I think that would be my main advice.